Um, hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Einat. Um, I'm not a professional speaker. It is kind of the first time that I'm sharing my own personal experience with such a group, uh, big group. So first of all, thank you for your patience with my English. It is not my native language. And because I'm new to this world of talking in front of uh, many people, I need like every once in a while just do like, yes, we hear you, or you know, some kind of affirmation that the message is transcend. OK. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, navigating in shamanic journeys using practice of yoga and meditation. I'm not an expert on this. I'm just sharing my own individual experience. So this is not a recommendation. I haven't researched it for decades of years. Okay, I'm just sharing from my heart. Um, so maybe a few um, words about myself. I've been a practitioner of yoga for the last 12 years or so. And I met Joe, the organizer, in a meditation course in Kopan Monastery in Nepal. And we kind of shared some experiences. And I guess he liked the way that I described my experience. So he invited me here to talk. So thank you, Joe, for having me here. Um, so I'm practicing yoga, vini yoga, which is kind of a very gentle move, uh, movement and breath kind of synchronization. And with the years, I found that this practice not just gives better ease for my body, but I kind of understand how my mind works better. I'm more able to be a little bit more balanced with my emotion or just accept whatever storm I'm under in. And yeah, basically I'm enjoying the time here hitchhiking in this galaxy. Um, I never wanted to do ayahuasca. Um, I heard 10 years ago, I heard crazy stories in Israel that you basically are not in this existence. OK, I cannot move there. OK, OK, OK. So this is my, OK. Um, so I heard really crazy stories. You vomit and you poop all night long, and really not something that I wanted to do. So I thought to myself, maybe I'll better stay with the LSD that I loved so much and kind of began to master that tool. And for me, always psychedelics was like very profound experiences. It was not just to dig in a party or something like that, but it was like, wow, connecting with this radio wisdom, as I call it, just like this universal wisdom that you kind of open your antenna to. Um, so I never had the intention, but I was in India, in Oroville, uh, which is a, um, a spiritual community in south of India. And I met a very, very group of, good group of friends, which until today, they are my spiritual family, my sangha. And they invited me to do a ceremonies with them uh, in Europe. And I thought, OK, I was not looking for it. But if it came to me, maybe it was like the time. I trust these people. But moreover, I trust myself in this experience. So after years of practicing psychedelics, I was ready to make the leap of faith to something that is a bit more uh, substantial. Um, so maybe a few words of what is meditation, because we all have different intentions, different practices that we do. OK, very dynamic, what is happening here. Um, so the practice of meditation, whatever you choose it to be, it can be running, it can be sitting, it can be dancing or making art. We have two practices, mainly. The first one is about creating a calm, clear, focused mind. And the second one, using this calm, clear, and focused mind, you kind of investigate a certain aspect within yourself. It can be self-healing. It can be why I have anger. Uh, it can be my compassion to the world. Whatever you choose, you take all this mass of mental ability and you just penetrate it until you, until you get the answer. So this is the two main practices of meditation. So maybe we can do a really one minute practice. I want you to sit with both of your feet on the ground. And if you are leaning back, try for a few minutes just not to lean back, but kind of sit with a straight back. Okay? And place your palms like on a comfortable pose on your thighs or in your lap, whatever fits you. And if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or just find a focus 
Yeah. Now we're just going to take a few breaths and try to just be with your breath. Meaning try to follow it all the way in, through the chest, all the, way all the way down. And on the exhale, from the lower abdomen up to the chest, out through the nose. And just take three more breaths, just like this. Focusing on the breath. Okay, I invite you to come back to existence. So we see when we are kind of directing our mind into something which the breath is kind of subtle, something happens within the mind. It kind of becomes more quiet. Maybe there is no more memories of yesterday, mysteries of tomorrow, but kind of we are able to stay in with this very subtle notion of this present moment. So this is how meditative practice is being applied, but usually it's longer than three breaths. Um, what is yoga? So I, I chose to, took, to take a definition from a very old scripture called Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And he describes the yoga as the complete orientation of the mental activities, meaning you take all of your mental power and you direct it into one direction. And it's better for this direction to be harmony, clarity, and total awareness. And the reason why we are doing all these crazy asanas is just that so we will create a strong and flexible body so we can sit and not focus on the body. So we can be in a healthy, strong body so it can hold itself, so we can really release, release our spirit from it. OK. So summer has come. And our date for the summer solstice to do the first ceremony has come. And I arrived um, with all of my beautiful group of friends. And we did like a, a sweat lodge with like a cleansing ceremony once before we did the ayahuasca. And we sat in a circle and we shared what is our intention for this ceremony. And each one said his own intention. And my intention for myself was to cultivate the substance, the ayahuasca, in my spiritual practice. And spiritual practice sounds very, very big. But in my intimate interpretation, it's just familiarizing myself to myself, shedding some layers and really getting into my core of truth. So that, that is the practice. Um, sharing our intentions and creating our inner scenery. Meaning, when we are with our eyes closed, what is your inner scenery? It, all, it is all of the things that you've been practicing, nourishing yourself. Meaning, if we are bombarded with news and so much information, smells, colors, and sound, it all exists within us. But if we're trying to kind of, what do I really want to plant within myself? We are starting to, to generate a new inner scenery. So either preparing myself in this journey, preparing myself physically, if it's to do a specific diet that you're not supposed to eat meat or smoke tobacco or drink alcohol. So for me, I'm a very serious student. So like two weeks before the ceremony, I already <laughs> began the fast, having a really, really strong intention. Um, the, prepara the mental preparation, again, is the meditative part of realizing that I, if I get lost in my thoughts, Usually, I can find a way, not all the time, but I can find a way to balance it, either focusing on my breath, focusing on a certain object. And the emotional, the emotional preparation is also the, the part that you are not getting carried away by your emotions. But you're kind of, OK, I see that there is sadness today, but I will not act from this. I just see that it's there. OK. That was our beautiful group of people. So you see that there is. Babies, little children, it's in a beautiful nature. And I think it's very important when we encounter ceremonies or kind of working with psychedelics is that we create like this environment that we feel safe with people that we trust. Um, getting your own magical things around you so you have like your own safety box with you, things that you like uh, around. And OK, so we came to the first ceremony. Um, the medicine guide, his name is Indius. He came from Brazil, and he's a part of the common Indius tradition, uh, which they have a specific recipe for the ayahuasca. It's called shamai. And whenever you encounter uh, common Indius around the world, you will always have the same medicine. So you're knowing exactly what you're going to get. They cook it like three weeks on the fire until it gets very thick, very good. 
it's not so disgusting to taste it. You don't, you don't want to vomit right away. Um, so calling for the first journey, for the first cup, sitting in a circle around the fire, friends holding instruments. I was lucky to have my artist friends. They are all musicians, so we all shared songs. Um, and while you are drinking your first cup, there is a first praying songs that is welcoming the medicine to your body. So drinking the first cup, okay, didn't taste so bad. I came back to my seat and humming the songs all around, nothing too dramatic happens. And there is a sentence, a saying in Hebrew, if there is a doubt, there is no doubt. So if you are doubtful, is it working, is it not working, maybe I'm feeling something or no, it doesn't work. You need to drink usually more or have the patience. Um, so looking at the fire, singing the songs, and suddenly something happened, and I'm looking at the fire, and it's no longer this three-dimensional fire, but somebody shift the whole dimension, and it was something completely different, this entity called fire. So I'm just observing it, not panicking or anything, just staying with this observer of, huh, this is very interesting. Closing my eyes, and then I saw like these beautiful geometrical shapes appearing that from other psychedelics, from LSD experience, we usually see kaleidoscope and all kinds of spirals and beautiful colors. But these colors i never seen before. If you ever seen a peacock feathers, they have beautiful turquoise and blue, and you don't understand where these colors are coming from. So this kind of colors. And this geometrical shape kind of became, in my vision, some kind of fungi or some kind of entity, which for me it was familiar as a fungi. And it was so beautiful and they were all smiling and just inviting me to come with them, really reaching for me and smiling and through the songs they are asking me to come with them. And in that stage I saw so much beauty that literally I start, my, art, my eyes became watery and I just started dripping tears just because it was so much beauty. And I knew that all this beauty exists within me. Like the preparation had done that this is, this is my inner scenery. And I was so, so grateful to see this. But coming back to my intention, I was grateful for the beauty. But I told the spirit plant that I am not here for the beauty, but I'm here to do some work. Um, and she asked me, are you sure? And then I said, yes. And then down the rabbit hole, I went. Um, so going through this maze and dimensions of being, coming back to what kind, some kind of myself, I really saw these two entities within me. But both of them were myself. On the one hand, there was my inner child that just wanted to be happy and just wanted to play along and just want everybody else to be happy. And she un doesn't understand why people are sad or why people are fighting in the world, and she kept on asking why. And on the other hand, there was this wise mother who kept on whispering these words of wisdom and have patience, and we are all in this together, and just saying all this wisdom that I knew that deep down was, was in me. But both of them were myself. I could not see, like that there was another entity whispering this, this words to me. <clears throat> uh, after a while, observing this and continuing with the, with the beautiful music, and I found that the music had really important role in this. It was really the, the, the navigating. It was really directing the ceremony. And it doesn't really matter if you knew how to sing or not, because anyway, voices are coming through you. So you better <laughs> allow it just to happen. Um, the second cup has arrived, ringing the bell if somebody wants to drink second cup, third cup. Some of my friends drank seven cups. Um, I just stayed with the second cup because I used to do a nice quantities of psychedelics. So my first intention is, yes, I want to do more. Uh, I was not sure <laughs> that it was the right thing back then, but anyway, I did it. And, and then all the demons that I heard that people talk about, they kind of spread their wings inside my body. 
And these demons that were this crazy shape within myself, it was my anger and it was my aggression and it was my judgment. Um, all of the things that you are trying to not look. So they kind of took shape and started moving through my body and I can feel myself so tired just lying on the ground, which was also not very smart. But just lying there and just all this judgment to my friends around came, babies crying and this baby is annoying me. And all these things that I'm like, where is this coming from? So I really started to feel not good with all these demons, and I just had to walk away from the circle. So somehow I made it into standing and grabbing on whatever I can in the forest, arriving to a safe tree, and just this dragon literally came out of my body. And it was not an easy process to give birth through them, to them, but it was really like this black thing wants to come out of my body. And as a practitioner of meditation, I try to give a true intention to whatever I do. So as this dragon wants to come out, I invite my anger to be released. I invite my judgment to go out. Maybe it was necessary in a specific time in my life, but for now, I don't need it. I ask them to come out. So they went out. <laughs> Not without a decent fight, but they went out. And after that, returning to the breath, returning to just inhale and exhale, just like we did before, was so much easy. There was so much space. And naturally, the breath became much, much, much longer. Also, there was pauses between the inhale and the exhale. In yoga, it calls kumbhaka, which means total stillness. Meaning there, there, is no, there is no breath that kind of interrupts. Yeah, No life is coming and no life is exiting. So I wish my inner de um, demons would look like this, but not really. <laughs> so as a part of the, of the meditative practice, whenever you feel not at ease, let's say it in a simple way, you just go back to focus on your breath. And instead of being um, quite serious with what is happening to your body, before you react, just observe. Just see how it goes in your body, because maybe there is nothing you can do besides allow this wave to pass through you. So you can always use your breath as your silent anchor. It will always be there for you. And after taking these demons out of my body, I was able to really enjoy and really delight on the fact that I have my friends and my voice, that I can rejoice in the fact that they, are so, they feel so comfortable that they can sing with their voice. They feel so comfortable that they can play music. So I was really rejoicing. Whenever a baby cried after that, after taking the demons out, I could really feel him as, as if my baby was crying and really wishing for him not to suffer just like I suffered 10 minutes ago. And, and innerly I was crying maybe. And also compassion for, the, for my friends around me that I saw that are dealing with these demons that I just took out. So compassion, like very basically, just grew out of my compassion to myself, compassion to my surroundings. So our intention, my intention in this journey really helped me to navigate, to go back to my center, to go back to my intention of why the hell did I drink that tea? So that was, that was my compass. Every time that you're like, you don't understand, you go back to your intention. Okay. Toward the end of the first ceremony, after he rang the bell for the third time and people came on going, I'm like, nope, I'm done with that. I'm just going to allow it to flow through my body. <laughs> uh, for the first time, I felt so confident and comfortable that for the first time, I offered a song a solo for the circle around me, a song in Hebrew. So for me, it was a, a very big breakthrough to, to deal with my own judgment for myself, but really allow this experience to come. Maybe it's a, yeah, okay. So as a part of uh, this form of ceremonies with the Common Ninjas group, which is like a psychedelic rainbow, <laughs> we can call it, uh, we did a sharing circle in the morning that we all shared one by one our experience, trying not to take the whole day, but kind of a few minutes to each one.
just to see how different we are and how different is our journey and that we are all in this together. Um, and knowing that our energy, each and every one of us, our energy in the circle is required and is necessary. And you belong into this. You are worthy to be here. That was our first ceremony. And after the first ceremony, Indius told us that usually the first ceremony, the body is getting to know the plant. They are starting to communicate. It kind of cleans what needs to be clean. It's kind of the initiation. So if there is an opportunity to do a second one or even a third one, it's much, much, much better. So the day, one day and one night after the ceremony, we had a vacation from the ayahuasca. And I found myself kind of disoriented. I just came from India, which I had my time and my space for myself, which I really love. And suddenly I'm, I was surrounded with all of my friends and their kids. And they have big kids and small kids, and they make a lot of noise kids. Um, a lot of sounds, not being judgmental. Um, but I could, I, I could not find my center because I was surrounded by people. I could not find this quiet place for myself to figure out just what I've been through. And I was just surrounded by these people who I really love. So I was kind of halfway here and halfway there. I want to be with my friends, but I need to be with myself for a bit. So I was, my mind was kind of <coughs> in a mess. So when the second ceremony came, and I had the, the privilege to give a guided meditation before the ceremony, um, I, I honestly thought maybe I will just be as, a, as, a, as the energy of the helper. I will not drink. I will just participate energetically. Um, but this suffering that I went through that day, which my mind was all over the place, I could not concentrate, I could not make sense out of anything, generated this really, really strong intention within me. Just please, mother plant, please just show me a drop of peace. And this intention was so strong for me that I really saw that my suffering, the suffering that I had mentally, was really generating this very, very strong wish. And as I was coming to drink the first cup, the only cup that I did that ceremony, I, I kneel to the ground and I ask the ground for its permission to be there. And I ask the other elements the permission to be there. And as I was drinking the medicine, I really asked it to enter each and every cell of my body. Do whatever it needs to do. I will not stand in her way. Whatever she needs to do, please do. I trust it. Just please show me a drop of peace. Um, so until the effect came, again, I was sitting, and I kind of repeated my mental mantra of just please, just drop of peace. Please, my body is open to you. Just repeating it, because that's a very good way to stabilize your mind. If you just repeat a mantra, and it does not have to be something from Sanskrit, just your own personal wish. You just repeat it, and just repeat it. And, and slowly she came, and slowly, and I call her she because it's a, it is a very feminine plant, and she was so kind, I really felt like she is holding me and kind of taking me with her, and I had a few questions for her, and because I generated such strong, strong sense of just please show me a drop of peace, she showed me an ocean of peace. And I, it felt so easy and so natural, like this is my natural way of being. So in that space where the mind was not kind of chit-chatting in the background, I kind of ask if, if this mother plant can show me how my body and my spirit are separate, if my spirit can leave the body. And then she showed me, but she doesn't show just by images. She doesn't just show with words. I kind of felt my body as I was sitting kind of trying to, to shake or vibrate or just the energy was shifting. And it was if like my spirit wants to leave the body, but the body does not want to be left behind. It was kind of scared to be left behind. So it was shaking. It, it was like a little kid like, no, please don't leave me. 
Um, so my first reaction was, oh, this body, it needs so much taking care of. You need healthy food, and you need to do some kind of physical exercise, and oh my god, this body. But then I heard this voice within me telling me that my physical body is like my horse, and I have to take care of it, and I have to take good care of it. So I said to my body, literally, I will not leave you behind, and everything is okay. So instead of like kicking this annoying child from me, I was just embracing it and, and inviting him to, to this journey. So I was sitting in a cross leg or sukhasana in, in, in yoga, and suddenly there was um, like two balls above my head, like another chakras above my head that I did not know that there, there were. Um, but instead of focusing in the breath within my body, I was focusing on the object outside of my body. And then it was so much easy. Like literally my spirit wanted to go into that places. And in that places when I was out of my physical body, suddenly I could see that all of my judgment and labeling and all this mental activity that I have, it's part of this technology called the human body. You come into this world, you get a body, you get a mind. And this is part of your mental abilities. But when you're outside of this technology, there is no judgment. There is just acceptance. And so I really enjoyed being in that stage where there is no chit chats and you can just meditate. It was an absolute meditation. Um, and then I was really delighting on it. And the mother asked me, would you like to stay here? And then I kind of think about it. And I'm like, no, I, I don't want to stay here because this is not the purpose that I came here. I did not come here to meditate in some cave or be on my cloud of happiness. Um, this is not my reason. And because I really enjoyed to be in that space, I asked, how can I reach it without the substance? How can I reach this meditation without the substance? And she just showed me, you just sit and you practice. There is no, no need to verbalize it anymore. You just sit and you practice. And then the third question came, which is kind of my most important question, is if this is not the purpose of my life, to sit into meditation, which is so easy and so natural, so what is the purpose of my life? Which is like the master question of all. And, and suddenly there was nothing. There was no answer. There was no outside voice. So I repeat the question again. So what is the purpose of my life? I could see slowly that my mind is sneaking in and, and want to answer instead of the plant. But I, again, I see you now and I ask him to step aside. And really, again, coming back to the question. Just to stay with the question. Don't try to answer it for yourself. And again, there was nothing there. And so I slowly opened my eyes. And I heard the music. And I felt the fire. And I saw the babies running around and laughing. And suddenly I realized that this, this is the purpose of my life. So it's nothing too dramatic, but it's basically to be. That is the purpose, to live, to life, to live and to be. Live, love, and be. Um, and then suddenly it was all like, ah, so this is much more simple than I thought. And, and, and I really felt that the being part is a very gentle aspect of balance balance between my ability to really retreat within myself and to be on my cloud and really also be able to be with my friends and my surrounding without losing my center. So it was a very, very gentle sense of being. So that, that's a psychedelic yin and yang. Um, so, and after, after realizing that for myself, I closed my eyes again, and the journey <coughs> returned in an instant. So she was very, very creative in showing me 
what I've been asked, what I wanted to, to know. And I really felt in time to time that she's going in my mind and trying to find out ways to make me see. Like what kind of terminology she can use so I can understand, what kind of image. Because if she would have showed me something that I would not understand, the lesson would not have been learned. So she was very creative. Um, so after my, all of my question has been answered, she kind of took me to a trip around the galaxy. I have no idea where was it, what was it. I know that in the second ceremony, I had no need to take any dragons out of my body. It was much more subtle. I was able to drink just one little cup. I did not need it more. Um, we did a sharing circle after this, the second ceremony, and I found myself, um, I think for the first or second time of my life, just writing. I don't like writing, and I just wrote whatever I could. Um, because in the experience itself, I try not to label whatever I was experiencing. I was trying not to analyze it, but rather let the experience flow through me and really be in that present moment. Um, that was my experience <laughs> so far. <laughs> and I think we have uh, still a few more minutes to, for questions or sharings or whatever you want to bring up. We still have time, yes? There's often been this sort of like dichotomy and argument between, oh, is meditation a psychedelic preferable and stuff? And I, I find that silly thinking. Um, and obviously, you've integrated your meditative practice into that uh, experience, as you said quite clearly, mm. and it helped you bring it down. And that I'm very interested in these, these particular types of experiences. What do you see if you were to create a practice between psychedelia and meditation techniques? How do you think they might be integrated and used together in a bigger system? Um, well, it's already there. Any, any type of meditation that you will do, the tool that meditation gives us is to create a calm, clear, focused mind. So when you encounter in psychedelic all this blah, 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 just your mind is whatever it does there, just vomits whatever you want inside your brain. Um, so you just go back to your center. You know, because in day-to-day -day life, we have the same experiences, but, but in psychedelic, you just take another shade, no? another color. You zoom, out, you zoom in into it, but the experience itself is the same. So if you are able to stabilize your mind in normal consciousness state, it will be much easier to do it on psychedelic because you can tap into that much, much easily. But basically, I would say focus on your breath. It can be one nice practice. And even to do it while you're doing something... For example, you take acid, um, so focus on, on your breath whenever you need, whenever you feel it's too much. If you feel that your heartbeats are going faster, you kind of focus on your heart, see what is happening there. And you, you also stay with the question. So what is happening to me? Oh, this one and this one. No, just stay with what is happening to me. And, and the body will say, you know. I found that the most important thing is to give an intention to whatever that we do. Um, so if you are doing psychedelic or even cooking dinner, it's not, it doesn't matter. But as long as you're giving a true intention to what you do, everything will become much better. You will be much more aware to every action that you will do. And whenever you get lost, that will be your compass. You're like, okay, now I remember why I did it. So you go back. And what did you experience first, psychedelia or meditation? Again? Well, it depends on the term, the term of meditation because we all, we all have different as experience. Practice. As a practice, um, I think meditation. I think meditation. But I'm, I'm practicing lucid dreaming, for example, without knowing that that's the label, practicing lucid dreaming. So that is also a form of meditation that you can start from where you are a kid. Or if you are jogging or riding bicycle, that's the perfect form of meditation. You allow this machine to just do what it does, and you are, you know, mentally you are doing something else, or your awareness is focusing on something else. So this is all part of, of the practices. Or, for example, if you are in a party, tripping, so you are dancing, this is the best way to get out of your mind and into your body. So you just need to let this machine do something. 
so you will be free from it. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, when you, <coughs> on the ayahuasca trip, and you start your setting, start setting in the Samadhi tank, what do you mean? Uh, it was a good idea when I turned to my ayahuasca and I swimming in a Samadhi tank. What do you mean? Samadhi tank? Yes. I said? A floating tank. Okay. Uh, I need you to repeat this question. I'm sorry. Repeat this question or rephrase it, uh, please. Have I a good trip on ayahuasca when I have the setting, the place? Uh, is in a Samadhi tank, you know, floating okay, tank, okay. Uh, isolation tank from Lili. And okay. uh, they are now uh, today more comfortable uh, as in 30 years ago. And I think that it's, uh, uh, for me, it's uh, to, to do a psychedelic trip is for me first to thinking about the right setting, the right timing that I learned from Timo Silieri. Mm. And uh, ayahuasca, I don't know, but I, I'm sure for myself when I do a very good LSD trip and I'm in a floating tank and I'm in the institute, Tantra Institute, uh, contact. Uh, massage and this, then you have a good starting and a good setting, and then you not come in hell, then you be in paradise. Because I take drugs not to go to hell, I want to go to paradise. Okay. Well, I, if you ask my personal um, opinion, the settings is just the potential, but we can always fuck things up. It's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. Um, so it, it can create a good conditions, but then you have to make the step, you know? You really have to, to, every time that you are dealing with your demon, it's not about, I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven, because as you go toward the light, you create this huge shadow behind you. So you want to see what is your demons, and you want to deal with them, and only when you go down to hell, you find the doors for heaven because you are dealing with your shadows. So it's not necessarily about a bad trip or a good trip. It's about how can I cultivate it in my, you know, in the way that I live or, for example, things that I need to solve in my life. So if you have the opportunity to do it in a very comfortable situation, that's great, but it will not guarantee anything. It's more about the, the inner scenery that you are, if you are watching all day long horror movies, it will be more likely that you will have those visions. But if you surround yourself with course, good people, I think you need a lifetime before. <laughs> yeah, but the ceremony, and your body is a church, and you can bring in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The preparation is very important, but the preparation is not just for the ceremony itself. So if you know that you're going to have an ayahuasca ceremony in two weeks, you will do more preparation. Yeah, You will maybe control your diet a bit more or whatever you consume into yourself. Um, but in the broader perspective, life is practice. So you want to keep on nourish yourself with good stuff and not from time to time, you know... Uh, Example when I do it in the jungle, and then there come an animal what I don't know. I'm afraid, and that's the energy what I not want, not I need on my trip. It's not for me clear vision. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, and I think that when we are back in our consciousness states, you can work on cultivating trust, and by cultivating trust, you release your fear. Because you trust, you trust the animal, you trust in yourself. But if you will be like, ah, oh my God, what is this? Usually the animal will also act in a certain way. But if you trust, then maybe it will not do anything, but it depends on the animal, I guess. Okay. Do we have any, any more time? Anybody has the time? 
Okay. Anybody has anything else you would like to share, ask, point out? Thank you very much. Just one question. Okay. How I can uh, unterscheiden what is the, uh, the right thing and what the, the wrong thing? I talked with you before this performance uh, that I think that 80% they would take profit because now this ayahuasca business and everyone talks about it and so there are a lot of people in South America too but only think for the money and how I can contact people they not only focus on to make money and then stuff really not good. Yeah. 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 Fabian, yeah. So it is a very good question to know who you can trust and if you can trust on the medicine I guess you just um, research, ask people, and because we really don't know, but it's, yeah, it's very hard. I was very lucky that my, my first invitation was with someone that I could trust and felt genuine, and we are now building this project of doing something more substantial, like the holistic point of view of, of yoga, so it's like 10 days of yoga, meditation, ayahuasca, art, just because many people want to do it but don't know where to go, you know? don't know who to trust. So this is one, one option. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, today at uh, 9 o'clock, I will invite you to a dance performance that I dance, Tribal Fusion, in the, before the party. And if you see me around and you have a question, you want to give me a hug or whatever, you are more than invited. Thank you very much.